Do you know how many states matter can exist in? If you've ever taken a physics class in school, you probably answered right away. Solid, liquid, and gas. And if you were a straight-A student, you might have confidently shouted plasma too. But to really ace today's lesson, that answer's just not going to cut it. Hey there, everyone! That's right, it's actually not as simple as you might think. Under extreme conditions, even the most familiar elements can take on properties so strange they almost feel like magic. So what kind of state are we even talking about here? Welcome to our channel. Stick with us and by the end, you'll understand it all. Alright, let's dive in! The Four Basic States of Matter Let's kick things off with a quick refresher on the basics. Out of the four fundamental states of matter, three of them, solid, liquid, and gas, have been known to humans since the days of the Stone Age. The easiest way to picture this is with water. Pure water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and boils at 212. This is something that happens all around us in nature, no special or extreme conditions required. But here's the thing, the conditions that trigger a change from one state to another aren't fixed forever like some universal constant. Those conditions actually depend on a whole range of different factors. One of those factors is the chemical makeup of the substance itself. For example, seawater, which contains salt, freezes not at 32 degrees but around 28. And even more important than composition is pressure. Take hydrothermal vents deep beneath the ocean, known as black smokers. These vents spew out water that can reach between 392 and nearly 572 degrees Fahrenheit. Yet the water doesn't boil. That's because the immense water pressure down there raises the boiling point to much higher temperatures. On the flip side, if you were standing at the summit of Mount Everest, you'd have a hard time making a decent bowl of soup. That's because the air pressure is so low up there that water boils at just around 154 degrees, which isn't nearly hot enough to cook properly. But why does that even happen in the first place? Understanding this is the key to everything we're about to explore in this video. The answer lies in the way molecules behave. So let's talk about what temperature actually means from a physics standpoint. When the molecules that make up a substance start moving around more energetically, the temperature goes up. And when you reduce the pressure, it takes less energy for those molecules to get moving. On the other hand, if you increase the pressure, those molecules need a whole lot more energy to start bouncing around. That's exactly why boiling happens at just 154 degrees on a mountaintop, or barely above 32 degrees on the surface of Mars. Thanks to advances in physics, by the end of the 1800s, scientists were able to describe a fourth state of matter, plasma. In solids, liquids, and gases, atoms keep their internal structure intact. But once temperatures get high enough, something called ionization kicks in. In the simplest kind of thermal ionization, atoms absorb an enormous amount of energy, start zipping around at high speeds, and crash into each other constantly. That leads to electrons getting knocked off atoms, or sometimes extra electrons getting picked up and stuck on. Plasma is, in short, a gas that's been fully ionized into a sea of free-floating ions and electrons. One of the most familiar examples of low-temperature plasma is something as ordinary as fire. In fact, when we look out into the universe, an astonishing 99.9% .9 of all baryonic matter is in a plasma state. Every single star out there is essentially a giant ball of plasma. Now that we've got a good grasp on the four basic states of matter and what they mean physically, let's move on to some truly fascinating discoveries. What happens if you take hot plasma and crank the temperature up even higher? Or if you take a solid and cool it down even further than what we're used to? Have you ever stopped to wonder about that? Because this is where things really start to get amazing. Superheated matter When plasma gets heated even further, it transforms into a state known as glasma. In this bizarre condition, it is no longer atoms colliding, but individual protons and ions slamming into each other. And with every one of those collisions, a web of interconnected electromagnetic fields springs to life. Glasma is incredibly unstable. It breaks apart in a flash, making it extremely hard to study in any detail. You can think of glasma as being like boiling water, 
a fleeting in-between phase where liquid and vapor are caught in transition. And just like boiling water, plasma can't maintain that state for long. If it gets too hot, it fully vaporizes. If it cools down, it turns back into liquid. Plasma behaves the same way. If it isn't cooled quickly, the protons and ions fall apart, breaking down into their tiniest building blocks, gluons, quarks, and antiquarks. It's the same kind of breakdown that happens during ionization when atoms get ripped apart. And from this process, we get what's called quark-gluon plasma. This substance reaches temperatures of several trillion degrees Fahrenheit. There's no place on Earth where you'd naturally find a quark-gluon plasma. In fact, the same goes for nearly all of the observable universe. Even deep inside the Sun, the temperature isn't high enough for matter to fall apart to this extent. What's more, the pressure inside the Sun is so extreme that even at a scorching 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, its core matter remains in a super-dense state. Scientists believe the universe was filled with quark-gluon plasma for just a tiny moment right after the Big Bang, and today, the only place it might still exist is buried deep in the cores of neutron stars. We haven't exactly ventured into the farthest depths of the cosmos. So for now, we have no choice but to rely on lab-created samples of quark-gluon plasma, tiny and fleeting though they may be. In laboratory conditions, this plasma only exists for the briefest moment and in extremely small amounts. But if we ever managed to create a stable sea of quark-gluon plasma, it would appear almost like an opaque, liquid-like substance. And unlike ordinary water, liquid nitrogen or molten metals, quark-gluon plasma behaves like a nearly perfect fluid. In other words, it has incredibly low viscosity. It can seep through even the smallest gaps and refuses to stick to any surface. Now, let's say you were somehow able to dip your hand into a pool of quark-gluon plasma and, by some absolute miracle, not get instantly vaporized. When you pulled your hand back out, it would come out completely dry. The fluid would have slipped right off in the blink of an eye. Let's be clear one more time. This is a purely hypothetical image. We're not actually talking about physically touching a substance that's hotter than the core of a star. No matter how curious you might be, touching it is definitely off the table. But let's say for whatever reason, you weren't too impressed with quark-gluon plasma. You could try cooling it down a little. When it's cooled, a process called hadronization takes place, a kind of chemical freezing of the plasma. That's when we get what's called a hadron gas and a phenomenon known as confinement starts to happen. Because of how strong interactions work, quarks can't exist freely on their own they're always forced to group up and form particles known as hadrons. If you like clever wordplay, that's a fun one to remember. Unfortunately for now, hadron gas remains more of a theoretical model than something we can fully study. Which means, sadly, we don't have much more to say about it, at least for now. Down to absolute zero. So far we've explored what happens when already blazing hot matter gets pushed to its thermal limits. Now, let's flip things around and look at the opposite extreme. This time we're cooling things down, even further, like a gas that's already frozen into a crystal at ultra-low temperatures. Unfortunately, this experiment gives us far less freedom than heating ever does. In theory, you can crank the temperature up endlessly, but cooling, that stops at a hard boundary, absolute zero. And that's exactly why it's called absolute. Absolute zero is negative 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit. And due to a number of physical limits, it's actually impossible to ever reach that exact temperature. The basic school-level explanation goes like this. To cool something down, you have to extract energy from it. And the colder it gets, the more energy you have to pull out. So to hit absolute zero, you'd have to remove an infinite amount of energy. And by definition, that's just not possible. So far, the lowest temperature humans have ever achieved is just a trillionth of a degree above absolute zero. In theory, we can keep getting closer and closer to this ultimate limit, but we'll never actually reach it. Still, the temperatures we've already been able to hit are more than enough to tackle the challenges facing modern low-temperature physics. When you cool matter down to that near-absolute zero range, just a trillionth of a degree above it, most of the particles inside settle into their lowest possible quantum state and freeze into near-total stillness. At that point, quantum effects, which usually require ultra-precise instruments to detect, start showing up on a large scale. You can literally see them with the naked eye. 
This fascinating phenomenon is called a Bose-Einstein condensate. And interestingly, it actually shares some traits with its complete opposite, the quark gluon plasma. Bose-Einstein condensates display something called superfluidity and behave like a nearly perfect liquid. That means this fluid can climb up the sides of narrow tubes, glide across surfaces without any friction, and spread instantly in every direction. Matter chilled to this extreme has another incredible trait, superconductivity. That's the ability to let electric current flow with zero resistance. These properties unlock all kinds of exciting possibilities and could even pave the way for science fiction level tech like flying cars. Unfortunately though, we're still very limited in how we can use them in real life. That's because keeping things cold enough to maintain these states burns through a massive amount of energy. And beyond that, there are still a few other strange states of matter we didn't have time to explore today. Most of those only exist on paper, as theoretical predictions or calculations by scientists. But if you're curious, we'd love to dive into those in a future episode. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Take care.